Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all from wherever you're joining us. My name is Babita Bish. I am the Deputy Director of Strategic Partnerships and Outreach in the Green Climate Fund, the GCF. On behalf of our team, I have the honor of opening GCF's leadership dialogue called Tipping Point or Turning Point, Global Solidarity for an Inclusive, Resilient Recovery. COVID-19 has unleashed an unprecedented health crisis and the biggest recession since the Second World War. We are at the cusp of several tipping points as leaders consider recovery options and weigh challenging choices. Yet this moment in history can be the critical turning point as we shift the paradigm towards low emissions, climate resilient and inclusive development for all. Today, we are joined by inspiring leaders who will speak to the challenges and opportunities in promoting climate resilient recovery in the context of COVID-19. I have the honor to introduce our distinguished speakers for today. His Excellency, President of Colombia, Mr. Ivan Duque Marquez, Her Excellency, Prime Minister of Barbados, Ms. Mia Motley, Her Excellency, Ms. Alet Sudan Nonal, Minister of Tourism and Environment, Republic of Congo, His Excellency, Minister for Climate Resilience, Environment, Forestry, Fisheries, Disaster Management of Grenada, Mr. Simon Steele, Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC, Ms. Patricia Espinosa, and our Executive Director, Mr. Yannick Klimarek. Her Excellency, Ms. Leonor Gewessler, Federal Minister for Climate Action, Energy, Mobility, Innovation, and Technology of Austria, and His Excellency, Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, Minister of State for South Asia and the Commonwealth, and Prime Minister's Special Representative on Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict from the United Kingdom will be joining us shortly. Allow me to brief you on the agenda of the Leadership Dialogue. Our Executive Director, Mr. Yannick Klemarek, will chair the event and will also deliver the opening remarks. This will be followed by statements from the President of Colombia and the Prime Minister of Barbados. Ms. Patricia Espinosa will then provide an overview of maintaining climate ambition in the context of COVID-19. This will be followed by reflections and responses, including statements from the ministers of Austria, Republic of Congo, Grenada, and the UK. We will then have a question and answer round, including an intervention from the China Council for International Cooperation, Environment, and Development. Please note that the President of Colombia will be represented by His Excellency, Minister of Environment, Sustainable Development, Mr. Ricardo Lozano, on his departure. The Prime Minister of Barbados will be represented by Her Excellency, Ms. Marsha Cadell, Minister for Economic Affairs and Investment. Lastly, a few housekeeping rules. To our speakers, please ensure your microphone is muted when you're not speaking. And to our listeners, we have simultaneous interpretation to French and Spanish. We would also like to call on audience members to share questions to our speakers through the Q&A tab. We are active and on all social media platforms, so please use the hashtag RecoverBetter or the hashtag UNG875 and help amplify the message of climate resilient recovery. Thank you again for joining us. I would like to hand it over to Mr. Yannick Lemarek to deliver his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavita. His Excellency, President of Colombia, Ivan Duque Marquez. Your Excellency, Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley. Honorable Ministers, dear colleague and friend, Executive Secretary of UNFCCC, Patricia Espinoza. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Green Climate Fund, it is an honor to welcome you today to our leadership dialogue in the margins of the 75th United Nations General Assembly. I would like to deeply thank you for joining us. Why is today leadership dialogue so important? At a time when the effects of climate change 
are already putting development outcomes at risk. The COVID-19 pandemic is creating a humanitarian tragedy. And as mentioned already, the broader economic collapse since the Second World War. In response to this crisis, OECD countries are undertaking expansionary fiscal and monetary measures at an unprecedented scale. However, much of the estimated $12 trillion of stimulus funding does not currently optimize the medium or long-term contribution to sustainable development and climate resilience. Developing countries, on the other hand, already the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, do not have the same monetary and fiscal space to roll out ambitious recovery packages. The massive outflow of capital from investors the precipitous drop in remittances and foreign direct investment and developing countries' debt burden have added huge stress on public balance sheets and threatened to wipe out decades of social economic gains. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought the world to either a tipping point or a turning point. Decision taken by leaders today to revive our economies will either tip us toward entrenching our dependence on fossil fuels or turn us toward low emission climate resilient pathways to achieve the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Whether the COVID-19 crisis proves a turning point to achieve the Paris Agreement and SDGs is to depend on global solidarity and leadership. How can global solidarity and leadership ensure that we maintain climate ambition in the era of COVID-19? First, climate action and COVID-19 recovery measures must be mutually supportive. Climate action must help to revive economies and economic packages designed to overcome the COVID-19 crisis must be green. Many investments can meet these dual objectives. For example, Investment in renewable energy, energy efficient climate resilient infrastructure, gender responsive climate resilient agriculture, and ecosystem based approaches can create jobs while scaling up climate action. Second, developing countries must be able to access adequate finance for their green economic recovery measures. COVID 19 exacerbates the existing climate finance paradox. On the one hand, trillions of dollars of savings are earning negative interest rates in many OECD countries. On the other, there exists between 11 to 23 trillion dollars in attractive opportunities for climate smart investment in emerging markets between now and 2030. But financial short-termism and the lack of consideration of climate risk into investment decision-making discriminate against climate investment. Low emission climate resilient investments tend to have high upfront capital requirement and long payback periods. They require policy stability and a shift in shareholder activism from quarterly returns to long-term sustainability. The international and domestic financial systems will have to change rapidly and deeply if COVID-19 is not to push the world beyond a point of no return. Over the past three decades, several actions have been taken to further align finance with low emission climate resilient pathways, including carbon pricing, climate related financial disclosure, green taxonomies and standards, and blended finance to de-risk projects and create new markets. However, only 15% of global emissions are covered by carbon pricing to debt, often at a cost too low to substantially affect investment decision. Climate-related financial disclosure remains voluntary and its adoption is slow. Green standards have yet to be harmonized and the experience of blended finance in climate change is currently mixed. The GCF is the world's largest dedicated climate fund and a partnership institution. It's co-financed climate initiatives supported by close to 150 delivery partners, 
including national and international commercial and development banks, UN agencies, and civil society organizations at the forefront of climate action. A key task of the fund is to accelerate the alignment of finance with low emission climate resilient development pathways in developing countries. With our partners, this includes assisting in the establishment of conducive investment climates, supporting project pipeline development through financing project preparation, leveraging blended finance to de-risk private investment in nascent market, mobilizing institutional investors and deepening national financial sectors and capital markets. Building on ongoing efforts, we would like to suggest a few concrete actions to accelerate the transformation of our financial systems. First, in preparation for COP26, countries will be raising the ambition of their nationally determined contribution to meet the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. They will be doing this during a devastating economic crisis. To maintain climate ambition in the era of COVID-19, NDCs must be translated into investment plans that revive developing countries' economies on a low emission climate resilient path without increasing debt burdens. New funding sources and financing structures will be needed to make blended finance work better for climate action in developing countries, and particularly in LDCs and Cs. In addition to concessional loans, a broader range of grant and non-grant instruments might be required, including first loss guarantees and equity. This, in turn, might call for new financial instruments, such as multi-country sovereign-backed guarantees fund, where highly rated AAA countries can join forces to drastically increase the leverage effect of public funds in climate action with high SDG co-benefits. Finally, we need to realize the full potential of national development banks. They account for investment of about $2 trillion a year, about 10% of total investment worldwide. Doubling their investment capacity, or leveraging effect, will be enough to bridge the climate investment gap. National development banks need to be given a clear green mandate and develop the governance, skills, and tools needed to assess the specific risk associated with investment in new climate technologies and business models. Co-financing from international climate finance, like the Green Climate Fund, can help them take on early investment risk and build a pipeline of bankable climate projects. These measures could contribute to the emergence of new asset classes backed by certified climate projects. This will reinforce the efficacy of carbon taxation, climate disclosure, and taxonomy approaches to green the behavior of the financial systems. Such new asset classes will need to gain the trust of financial actors, which will require transparency on their climate impact and third-party verifications. Digital technology can dramatically reduce the transaction and search costs for information about green assets, helping to build the trust in a cost-effective manner. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, these are just a few suggestions to start our discussion on the different avenues explored by global leaders and development partners to foster an inclusive climate resilient recovery based on global solidarity. Once again, many thanks for joining us and thank you for your attention. It is now my immense privilege to invite the President of the Republic of Colombia his Excellency, Mr. Ivan Duque Marquez, to share with us his views on the challenges and opportunities for Colombia to recover from COVID-19 toward a more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient uh, society. Excellency, I also take this opportunity to congratulate you for your leadership. Colombia just announced a new economic recovery plan 
that will spend $4 billion on renewable energy and energy transmission projects, including wind, solar, geothermal, and hydropower. In addition, Colombia's commitment to address deforestation, including at the second presidential summit for the Amazon, is inspiring. This would be crucial to significantly increase the number of formal jobs in the Amazon region and preserve Earth, biodiversity, and climate. Your Excellency, you have the floor, please. Thank you so much. It is a great privilege uh, for me to participate in this very important event. I want to express my gratitude to Janique. I want to express my gratitude to Babita, say that it is a great honor to share this space with uh, our good friend, Her Excellency Mia Motley. I'm also expressing my gratitude to Simon Steele, Patricia Espinosa, Minister Lozano, Minister Bloom. It is a very important session, the one that we're opening this morning, because everything was planned to happen in the midst of uh, a different circumstance. But today we're joined virtually due to the effects of COVID-19. Nevertheless, we are united by virtuality and we're about to address also the biggest challenge of our time, which is climate change. And climate have intertwined. The crisis of climate change in the, mid, in the midst of COVID-19 has allowed the world to make powerful reflections or where are we heading to? And how can we accelerate the measures, the visions, the policies in order for us to mitigate its effects? The Green Climate Fund has been a very important instrument that has been active for many years, but that has inspired countries to build financial solutions that are targeted to produce positive effects in the way we contribute to reduce the negative effects of climate change. A country like Colombia represents only 0.4% of all the world's CO2 emissions. But I must say that we want to address this problem as if we were the main emitter of CO2. Why? Because this is our moral duty. This is our call to action. And we have to build it consistently, coherently, and we have to combine all the tools that are necessary that involve the public sector, the private sector, and obviously civil society. We need to combine financial tools with policy instruments. We need to combine clear, sustainable, and measurable goals with the possibility to have an increased commitment of all the citizens in our countries so that it is also our individual ethics of the 21st century in the contribution that we all can make to reduce our CO2 individual footprint. But I want to share with you this morning the things that are taking place in Colombia and why we are so highly committed. Number one, Colombia wants to lead the energy transition in Latin America and the Caribbean. Two years ago, when we first started our mandate, we had less than 50 megawatts of installed capacity of solar and wind energy. As of today, we have multiplied the installed capacity by six times. And by the end of our term in August 2022, it's going to be expanded by 20 times and we will have more than 2,200 megawatts of installed capacity in solar and wind. That means we will pass from 0.1% contribution in an energy matrix by non-conventional renewables to more than 10%. And the goal is to keep the country aligned so that in the next decade we can reach 30%. 
Those goals are clear, but they also involve the participation of corporations. And I'm glad to say that the state-owned oil company, Ecopetrol, has become in just two years the largest auto generator with solar capacity in Colombia. That demonstrates that we are looking for a balance, but also that we conceive that energy transition contributes to our efforts to reduce the negative impacts of climate change. And we also consider that Latin America needs to move in the direction that by 2030, 70% of the regional energy matrix has to be based on renewable energies. We made that commitment last year in UNGA and we make it today. We want to help, we want to lead, and we want to coordinate that effort. Number two, Colombia has made a big effort in clean mobility, clean transportation. We approve the electrical vehicle bill last year in Congress, and we are seeing now a tremendous expansion of the substitution in the car park, even in times of the pandemic, so that people are more conscious about the impact of clean mobility in the quality of air and in the quality of life. The incentives that we have established are going to accelerate dramatically and positively the, possi the possibility for more citizens to contribute with a clean transportation that is consistently working hand in hand with the expansion of non-conventional renewable energies in the country. Number three has to do with our fight against deforestation. For many decades, Colombia had an awful rate of deforestation year by year. And in the last two years, with the programs that we have implemented, including the Artemisa campaign, where we fight against illegal economies that are destroying our tropical jungle, we have reached today a reduction of the rate of deforestation that is close to 20%. Am I fully happy? No, I'm not. Yes, we have achieved the largest reduction in the rate of deforestation, but there's more to be met. And we will continue to embrace this cause, but we're also building it with the possibility to provide peasants the opportunity to, to be paid for environmental services and that we identify nature-based solutions so the families that are surrounding these areas can become successfully involved in protecting the tropical jungle, especially in a country where more than 30% of our soil is in the Amazonic basin and 50% of our territory is tropical jungle. Four, we have been making a big call internationally to protect the Amazon basin. And as you well pointed out, we called last year with the help of the president of Peru, Martin Vizcarra, to build the Leticia Pact, where we elevated at a presidential level, not only the commitments, but the goals on how to protect the Amazon, how to work with indigenous communities, and how to identify nature-based solutions so that we can reforest and protect. But at the same time that we build common indicators, common goals, and we can monitor them. And I want to express my gratitude to GCF because you have supported us and you have made this discussion be aligned with the capability of providing financial solutions to local communities and local governments in this purpose. We consider the Leticia Pact as a very important milestone in environmental policy. Why? Because it's led by the presidents. And at the same time, because it goes top down in the way we conceive all the policies, the larger ones, the smaller ones, and the daily actions. Fifth, we're moving forward with the circular economy policy in Colombia. We have saw the term that is based on produce conserving and conserve producing. And that the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, are fully embraced by corporations, are fully embraced by citizens, and that we can have a, re a big transformation in the way we manage waste and in the way we can connect waste to become energy. Six, 
We are a country that has 50% of the world paramos. And the paramos are very important in this discussion because the paramos are the sources of pure water for millions of citizens. And it's one of the most complex ecosystems in the world. And as I say, yes, we have 50% of the world paramos, but we have regions in Africa and Central America that also have this type of ecosystems. And I want to express today before GCF that Colombia, as the host of the pre-COP for biodiversity in 2021, wants to put forward a strategy so that the whole world can acknowledge the importance of the Paramos and that we can mobilize resources for the protection of the Paramos and that we can involve the communities that live within the Paramos so that they can also participate actively in nature-based solutions and they can become Paramo guards, Paramo protectors. Because this is also a big challenge. Seven, biodiversity. We are the country with the second largest biodiversity per square kilometer in the world. We have thousands of species. We know the value of this treasure, but we need to conceive also an ethics around the world on the protection of biodiversity. And as we are going to be host of the biodiversity pre-COP in 2021, we're launching with the World Economic Forum and with the support of multilateral donors, a program that we have called Biodiverse Cities, which involve cities in the protection of biodiversity. And that means thinking on the quality of air, reforesting, protecting species, having the ethics of the 21st century in all the citizens protecting the environment, and also being able to mobilize capital to protect those species and highlight that they are a treasure for the world. And last but not least, all these efforts that we are making require resources. We just made a big reform in Colombia on the royalty system. And for the first time, we're going to be devoting resources from royalties to protect the national environmental system. For us to protect the quality of air, the quality of water, the quality of our forest, the quality of all the environmental community. Because we believe this is the most important challenge that we have before us. And as I said at the beginning of this conversation, Colombia represents 0.4% of the world's CO2 emissions. Colombia has one of the cleanest energy matrix in the world. But nevertheless, Colombia is one of the most threatened countries by the effects of climate change. We must combine all the tools that we have. We must combine all the energies, all the enthusiasm, all the policies, so that we can build a world that really contains the effects of climate change. And I believe GCF has proven to be a very important tool. We want to continue to the strengthening of GCF. And we want to invite GCF to identify new mechanisms that can connect the funding of the cause against climate change with the possibility of linking it with the development of capital markets. We see an opportunity in Latin America so that we can really have markets that are linked with carbon credits. We also want to link the possibilities for corporations to donate resources for this cause with the right incentives. And they can be also able to compensate some of the effects they produce. And I'm pretty sure we can do it with the GCF. These are the challenges that we face in Colombia. We are highly committed and we know that COVID-19 has been a call from nature to humankind. This is the time for us to be more relied on our humane condition. And the most important of the humane condition is to be able always to keep awareness that we can only survive as a species if we understand that our main role is to protect nature. Thank you very much.
Your Excellency, President Ivan Duques Marquez, the uh, many thanks for your very inspiring uh, remark. It was a privilege for the Green Climate Fund to be asked to support your vision for the protection of the Amazon. And we look very much forward to uh, working with you on the potentially new sources of finance and structure to uh, preserve the Earth biodiversity and climate. We are at your disposal and we feel very privileged to have had the opportunity to work with you and your teams. As a, a participant might have noticed, uh, we were also very privileged to have Prime Minister of Mir Motley from, uh, the Barbed from Barbados to attend the opening of uh, this uh, conference. Unfortunately, due to uh, connection problems, she will not be able to uh, deliver our opening remarks uh, right now. Therefore, Our Excellency Ms. Marsha Cadol, Minister of Economic Affairs and Investment from Barbados, has kindly agreed to deliver uh, the remarks of uh, Prime Minister Miamotli on her uh, behalf. The uh, Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yannick. It's very good to see you again. Um, the last time having been all the way in Korea when we had a wonderful discussion. Um, I want to say hello to President Marquez from Colombia and to all the other uh, distinguished panelists with us this morning. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Prime Minister is not able to be with us. And I think that rather than deliver her remarks, which only she can do, what I'd like to do is to be able to follow on a bit from President Marquez and to talk a bit about what does it mean for real green economic recovery in the case of Barbados. Uh, in our case, what we talk about is green and blue economic recovery. Uh, we are an island. We are a small island developing state. Uh, and we are part of a grouping of CARICOM countries that have similar challenges. Now, this meeting is in fact timely to be able to share with colleagues a lot of the work that we've been doing in realizing that kind of green and blue economic recovery. This week, we had the official open, reopening of parliament for its second session. And on that occasion, we had the speech from the throne from the governor general. The, the Governor General's throne speech really was an opportunity for us to take fresh guard as a government um, along with all of our partners and to be able to lay out uh, what is our green uh, and sustainable economic recovery plan with respect to COVID-19. We as a country um, really had to hit the ground running uh, it, is, it is quite the experience to have had to complete a domestic and external debt restructuring um, that saw us move from 176% debt to GDP to 117%. And to be able to stabilize so many other macroeconomic variables uh, and then to be hit with the health, economic and social crisis of COVID-19. So it called for us really to reset and to reconsider and to look at what we're doing. When uh, I started to have a discussion with colleagues from Green Climate Fund about the challenge that countries have to really realize a green economic recovery, I suppose my initial response was that there's only one kind of economic recovery. And it is that we have to be able to closely align our social and economic objectives with our climate resilience objectives. Um, when we launched the program that, um, that others may have heard about called the Roofs to Reefs program, we, we shared that and we presented that as our development pathway for the next 10 to 20 years. It has at its heart climate resilience. It is all about the circularity of how we live, our biodiversity, our solidarity on climate um, ambition, and how we make sure that people are at the heart of investment, of economic growth, and of climate resilience. And so for us, there can be no separation 
um, that between climate resilience and economic growth and recovery and the well-being of people. So let me say a bit about what we, what we shared this week with the country and with our neighbors in terms of what our green and blue economic recovery looks like. COVID-19 has been completely devastating for tourism-dependent economies. It has essentially meant that we have fallen to zero revenue in a sector that is responsible for 40% of GDP and 40% of, of employment. It means that we can have no recovery without looking at the relationship between the tourism sector and climate um, and sustainability. And so what we are just launching this week is the Barbados Employment and Sustainable Transformation Program. There's several elements to the program, and I think it would take me the full 10 minutes to go through all. But I, what I want to highlight is that it's a $300 million investment in the tourism sector that helps them to be able to re-engage workers um, for the very specific purpose of transforming the sector. Now, we anticipate that we will start to see um, full return to the kinds of occupancy levels and the kinds of um, activity in the sector that we would expect perhaps within 12, 12 to 18 months. Right now, the sector is at about 40% occupancy in terms of hotels. Uh, that is actually um, perhaps better than similar economies are doing. Colleagues may have heard about the launch of our 12-month welcome stamp, which I think surprised us all um, with how well it has been received. And so these are the kinds of initiatives that mean that we've been able to see some recovery in the sector but not the full recovery. And so what we call the BEST program, the Barbados Employment and Sustainable Transformation Program, is a way in which we will use this time until the sector comes back to full operation to encourage firms in that sector to invest in the re-engagement of workers because one of the things we can ill afford to see is prolonged um, disengagement and unemployment in a sector that, that's that large. But more importantly for this discussion, it also focuses on being able to facilitate and help invest in transformation, in, in green recovery, in the use of digitalization and green technologies to make sure that tourism-based firms are fully competitive, to give them the opportunity to make sure that um, renewable energy technologies are fully used in plants, um, to make sure that there is opportunity um, to pull in investment from regular Barbadians um, into this kind of renewable energy. And so the BEST program is really where we are fully locating um, our plans for green economic recovery. There's no um, hope to restructure our very important tourism sector unless we understand that that sector has to lead the way in terms of implementing renewable energy technologies, solar and other, and otherwise, in order to see full transformation. And so that's a project that we've just launched this week. Another project that focuses on, on energy and how we link um, housing opportunities for all in the use of energy is what we call the HOPE program. And that was also shared um, with the country and with our colleagues uh, in the throne speech this week. It is called HOPE, which stands for Home Ownership Producing Energy. Now, when we first shared the Roofs to Reefs program, a big part of that initiative was to make sure that we are able to involve regular Barbadians in investment in, in energy, in renewable energy at the household level. And this is not just about um, making energy affordable for all, but it's also about being able to provide investment opportunities and income earning opportunities for, for regular Barbadians and those who live here. And so the Home Ownership Providing Energy Program is a $250 million investment in providing at least a thousand homes um, and for, for, for scale and for reference, uh, I should remind colleagues that the population of Barbados is about 290,000. Um, but it is, it is to provide at least 1,000 homes um, to those who uh, are less able to afford their own housing 
And built into that is the use of renewable energy in each of those homes, the production of energy to be able to also be able to sell it into the grid um, and to earn income um, for those families. Uh, being able to address the regulatory issues around the production of energy uh, and the distribution of energy has been a very big part of our work and our green economic recovery. And also this week, the Ministry of Energy has been working with the main producer uh, to make sure that we solve some of these pricing and tariff setting and regulatory issues that mean that all people will be able to be a part of that green recovery. We've also set a target of being fossil fuel free by 2030. Um, and I don't think that we can have any greater example of ambition for a small island uh, than this. As a part of this, we've recently rolled out for the first time the use of electric buses as part of our transportation system. We started with 33 electric buses. Uh, we expect that number to increase. Uh, but it is, it is a part of an entire system of making sure that we are in a position to hit or come close to that target of being fossil fuel free at best, carbon neutral at worst, we say, uh, by 2030. Uh, as I mentioned, a big part of that has been how we address the regulatory environment. Um, and so the work continues on that. But I also want to emphasize that we, we make sure at every point to link our goals um, on renewable energy uh, to our goals on economic enfranchisement. And I'll say what I mean. When we came up with the revised energy policy, one of the things we made sure of is that we are able to allocate 5% um, of the savings from investment in renewable energy to the transportation sector, for example. Um, we've made a decision that all renewable energy projects that are driven by foreign direct investment must have at least 30% local ownership. Uh, these are the ways in which our green economic recovery is linking the need to integrate renewable energy into our plans uh, and, to, and to meet the fossil fuel free target, but also to never ignore our mandate of economic enfranchisement for all Barbadians. And so in our recovery plan, we are very much linking um, income earning opportunities, investment opportunities for all Barbadians with our targets in the, um, with respect to being fossil fuel free. Uh, We've had a great interest and a great thrust in the area of renewable energy investment um, globally in Barbados. Uh, we have certainly for this year, earmarked um, about 100 megawatts of capacity. That's just initially in projects that are gonna be an immediate part of our recovery. Um, that total around almost $600 million. And so we expect that that, that that those projects are gonna be a big part of helping us to reach the targets um, that we ha have, have um, set. I should also say though, in the time remaining, um, that you know, it's very important for us to keep focus on the balance of adaptation and mitigation, to keep focus on the balance of ambition and the solidarity um, that countries like Barbados have exercised in terms of being able to reduce our emissions. Um, we are working right now in our, on our second national determined contributions and making sure that we maintain um, that ambition and that solidarity. But we need to, to keep right the balance of adaptation and mitigation. We need to keep the focus on disaster risk management, on the fact that the climate crisis has really changed the way in which our economies are able to respond to and recover from uh, natural disaster. Um, and I think for us that this is where we have so appreciated the evolution and the dialogue with the Green Climate Fund, because in the roof to reef discussion uh, and in working with GCF to help us build that project out, we've been able to maintain quite a focus on adaptation um, and on how our economies recover. 
I want to say quickly, um, because I'm sure there'll be a lot more time for discussion in the sessions that follow, um, that biodiversity is also important to us. We have a region called the Scotland District that's about 15% of our total land mass. And also in the throne speech this week, what we were able to do is to announce specific projects to stabilize the area, um, to make sure we address issues related to slippage, but also make sure that through the Scotland District Authority, um, which is a new authority that we're establishing, that we're able to keep a focus on biodiversity and to make sure that the kinds of um, natural assets that we have in those areas are not lost because that's important to our legacy and that's important to our culture. I would say finally that one of the things that we really need to be able to address is how we encourage investment in climate resilience. How we investment, encourage investment in climate resilient um, infrastructure, but also in climate resilient processes. And one of the things that we've been looking at is the question of how we understand and price risk in economies and countries like Barbados. Uh, we have to be able to make sure that whether it's through the use of first loss insurance or other instruments, that we're able to send the right signals, that we're able to, to craft and create the kinds of tools that are going to first adequately um, and properly price risk, because sometimes what we experience is perhaps a lack of understanding in global markets about really what is the nature of the risk um, related to climate uh, in small economies like ours. And so this is one of the areas in which we believe that the Green Climate Fund can partner with us. We've started some work uh, that we're happy to share with all colleagues, but we think that this is going to be an important part of the discussion. So with that, I want to thank um, you, Yannick, and the other panelists who will follow. Uh, I think this is a very timely discussion. I think that there can be no discussion on economic recovery that does not look at access to um, concessional resources, access to blended finance, um, but also how we make sure that climate resilience is integrally um, connected to all of our recovery work. Thank you. Many thanks, Marsha. It was a pleasure last year to discuss uh, with you the roof to reef uh, programs. And uh, it's great to have an opportunity to hear about the best and hop uh, program. Yeah, Barbados is definitely much better than the Green Climate Fund at uh, coming with, uh, with, uh, with basically acronyms that convey a strong message of hop. The, uh, the one of the main problems that we have to foster uh, green resilient recovery is a lack of policy integration. And it's, uh, it's very interesting to hear about the approach uh, the, uh, taken by Barbados to integrate all its different uh, policies. I think a theme that will most likely come back to the floor when uh, our friend uh, Minister Simon Steele will be uh, speaking, because uh, if my uh, memory of uh, our last discussion is correct, it's something which is also very, very close to, uh, to his heart. The, uh, regarding the importance of uh, valuation, evaluate, uh, better valuation of risk, better mainstreaming of risk into investment decision making, better valuation of uh, climate resilience investment. We are actually working uh, in Jamaica on the uh, evaluation of uh, better valuation of uh, climate resilient infrastructure. And uh, it's an immense wealth of knowledge that uh, we could uh, we could maybe help share uh, among uh, the Caribbean uh, uh, island state, especially because if uh, we can forge a common vision, we can also uh, uh, aggregate uh, the different capacities and market and use different type of instruments. Here again, some things that I believe uh, our friend uh, Simon will be, uh, will be uh, discussing. So many, many thanks, uh, uh, Marsha. The, uh, I would like not to uh, to give the floor to uh, uh, my colleagues and, and friend, uh, the uh, Patricia Espinoza from uh, the Executive Summary from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, Patricia, it's a real pleasure to uh, see you. We had a chance to discuss not so long ago, the two of us, a couple of weeks uh, ago. The uh, you are always. Uh, 
an unbelievable source of knowledge about uh, where we stand regarding global efforts on the climate change. And so can I ask you maybe to, uh, to uh, educate us on the latest uh, global efforts to maintain climate ambition in the era of COVID-19? Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yannick. It's really an honor and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share with you some general remarks. Uh, señor Presidente Iván Duque, es un enorme gusto poderlo saludar y escuchar eh, todos los esfuerzos que Colombia está realizando. Dear Minister Cadell, uh, thank you very much for that just amazing introduction on everything that you are doing in your beautiful country, one of those uh, highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Dear friends, these are extraordinary times. Never in its 75 year history had the General Assembly been compelled to carry out most of its work along with the valuable events that take place on its sidelines through virtual meetings. This measure seeks to mitigate the risk of disease, but it also reminds us of our vulnerability in the face of natural threats. 2020 will be a difficult year to forget. The rapid transmission of COVID-19 around the world has caused terrible losses, both human and material. It has disrupted nearly every aspect of our daily lives whether at home, in school, or at work. The IMF has described the economic impact of the pandemic as the most severe in ne nearly a century. The recovery is likely to be prolonged and difficult. The global pandemic presents a formidable challenge for humanity today. With varying degrees of success, but a similar sense of urgency, most countries rose to that challenge. Business as usual, in the case of COVID-19, was never going to be an option. Consequently, authorities and societies changed the way they conducted their everyday activities, placing health and the protection of life as their main priorities. These elements, three elements of this global response should be highlighted. First, the application of public policies founded on evidence and guided by technical and scientific advice, not political expediency or economic reward. Second, the spirit of solidarity and collaboration among countries, which has been evident in the quest for effective treatments and vaccinations. Third, the active engagement of every member of society in the collective effort to contain the spread of the virus. These three elements, science, solidarity, and social engagement, have proven to be effective to address the immediate danger posed by COVID-19. They are also essential when confronting climate change, which is humanity's most serious threat today and in the long run. The scientific evidence that we are in the midst of a climate emergency is irrefutable and it continues to mount. In a little of over a year, the IPCC, the international body responsible for gathering and analyzing climate change, has produced three disturbing reports that confirm that the oceans are acidifying, the soil is degrading, and the ice caps are melting as the world continually loses biodiversity. The findings are clear. Time is running out and we must act now. Just as the pandemic demanded immediate action to minimize risk and potential loss of life, so does the rise in global temperature. They are both critical challenges to the well-being of humanity and it would be irresponsible to focus on one while postponing the other. This session's title puts the issue across very well. We are approaching either a tipping point, that is to say, an abrupt and irreversible change in the global climate system of unforeseeable consequences, or a turning point, 
a moment in which changes in policy and practice around the world lead to effective climate action so as to limit rise in the global temperature to 1.5 degrees. Science has shown us the magnitude of the risk we are facing. We have already agreed on the course of action that we need to follow in order to avert that risk. The Paris Agreement lays down a clear set of actions that will lead the world towards a future of sustainable growth. Our duty is to turn it into reality. This brings me to the second point I wish to make today, which concerns the spirit of shared responsibility that should also be a central element in our global response to climate change. Nearly five years ago in Paris, the international community reaffirmed its political will to ensure that all nations have access to adequate financial resources to support their efforts against climate change. This responsibility falls largely on the more prosperous, industrialized countries. The reason is simple. Without their support, the poorest and most vulnerable countries will be unable to achieve their goals and to carry out their contributions in the global effort against climate change. And today we have heard from Colombia and Barbados how much of an effort they are undertaking. And this, we need to understand that this is not solely a matter of solidarity. It is also a question of fairness. Many countries achieve their wealth due to industrialization and emissions intensive growth. Given what we know now, developing countries will not be able to follow the same path to economic growth and prosperity. Acknowledging this responsibility, developed countries made a pledge to mobilize $100 billion annually in funding for developing countries to support their action on mitigation and adaptation, a goal that was to be achieved by 2020. This should not be seen as an act of generosity, but rather as an investment for the benefit of recipients and donors alike. It is an act of solidarity, but also of self-interest. If the finance commitment is not fulfilled, the credibility of the entire process will be undermined. In addition, providing adequate and timely financial resources is a precondition for success in all other areas. However pressing other priorities in the fight against climate change may be, few of them are likely to succeed without enough funding. This is the ultimate basis for any effective and lasting progress on capacity building loss and damage, adaptation, and technology transfer. The need for adequate financing to address climate change has not diminished amid the COVID-19 pandemic. If anything, it has become even more pressing as the major economies of the world mobilize massive resources to mitigate the impact of the economic downturn and to support the recovery underway especially among industrialized nations. This brings me to my third and final point. While the finance initiative is rightly focused on the poorest and most vulnerable countries, as the 100 billion pledge clearly indicates, it is essential to develop a comprehensive approach that takes into account all types of finance, public and private, domestic and international governments, multilateral institutions, private corporations, banks, investors, and civil society all must engage more actively in climate action. All have a critical role to play in the transformation that the world needs. Over two centuries of sustained economic activity, largely based on fossil fuels, will require an extraordinary effort to move away from the long-standing approach to financing that overlooks or disregards the climate consequence of investments. In particular, civil society must demand that the issue of climate change become a central element of financial policies and practice. People, as we know, have the real power, the power 
to either give or withdraw their support from governments and corporations according to their commitment to climate action. Paradoxically, the COVID-19 pandemic has given us a unique opportunity to rethink and renovate our economic and social systems in ways that not only help us better address climate change, but also move us towards a more sustainable, resilient future. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Many thanks, uh, Patricia. The, uh, uh, dear speakers, we have received quite a lot of questions from, uh, from participants. So uh, uh, will you accept to, uh, to take some of these questions? Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Ricardo Lozano, Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of Colombia. I don't know if His Excellency, uh, President Duque Marquez, is still uh, one of us or uh, will you be prepared to take the questions on behalf of uh, Colombia? Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Jadik. It's, uh, no, it's really, really, really pleasure to be with you. Yes, and um, I have here just to to uh, to respond any any kind of question, of course, about uh, this climate uh, climate change, as of course also this important uh, conference and forum. And thank you very much again, as to to say that the uh, that the, for us is very important to to thank you for for the support to Colombia in in order to implement that kind of project and initiative that the, our president Ivan Duque has said before. So if you have any question? So we, we, are we, do have a, we do have a number of questions specific uh, uh, to Colombia. Maybe if I can uh, read one of them at least. Uh, what nature-based solution implemented by Colombia is giving results? Yes, um, I think the most important nature-based solution that results is uh, related with the, that we could reduce the deforestation effects that our country has. You know, uh, as uh, our president said before, that the, when you compare the 2015 year with the 2018, we could reduce the 20% of the reduction, especially in the Amazon region and where we had uh, the huge uh, hotspot of the deforestation. How? Including the new governance, where, which the most important pillars are related with the legal, the legal issues, with the investment with the entrepreneurs and with the local community entrepreneurs in order to identify the new alternative, economic new alternative for everyone that is living there. And uh, as I said, the president said before that the, our uh, national development plan also include two years ago, the, uh, the principal uh, concern producing and um, produce conserving that wish that they, we can uh, use our natural resources in our jungle, for example, with the Amazon region. So that is the huge, the huge uh, issues that we already, we are, I think we are, we are championing the region with that. For that reason, we could sign the, the pact of Leticia with the rest of the countries of the region. So that is the, the and now the huge opportunity to push forward in order to get another kind of issues, for example, the implementing new monitoring system for not, to, not just for Colombian people, for the rest of the region of the Amazon. Many thanks, uh, Minister, the, uh, for this very insightful uh, point. So I will maybe read another question. Most of the questions have to do with uh, ecosystem management, the links between ecosystem management, climate, COVID-19, and are fairly technical, but uh, the, uh, uh, Masha, would you like to take this one about, uh, is ecosystem services valuation a necessary field for sustainable development? 
would providing monetary values to ecosystem services threaten their importance? Um, yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Thank you for that. That's, that's, that's a very important question. I think sometimes that we have this kind of overemphasis on valuation. I mean, that sounds strange coming from an economist, but I think we have to be careful about what attaching monetary value um, to certain assets, um, what is the outcome? Now, with that said, I think that when it comes to the blue economy, um, we have been doing quite a bit of work to really understand what is around us. Um, the, in terms of our ocean, um, it's more than 440 times um, our land mass. Um, or, or marine area. And the establishment of a Ministry of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy has meant that uh, we really need to understand what is, what is around us and what those assets are. Now, in fact, we've been, um, and, and the Ministry has been working on a debt for nature swap um, that has meant that we are establishing marine managed areas and we're making that commitment with the establishment of marine managed areas um, in order to mobilize resources for investment in resilience and sustainability. Uh, and so a part of that has been, it's been important to have this valuation of natural capital um, to be able to understand what, what is that real value that is sitting out there around us and how can we leverage that to make sure resources come back for investment in climate resilience. So I think like the person who asked the question, I understand that there is a bit of a trade-off. You don't want to only attach a monetary value because that may distort certainly for vulnerable economies like ours with debt sustainability issues. Um, we don't want to distort our macroeconomic variables. We don't want to inflate GDP. We don't want to take um, the, the eye off the fact that um, we have certain um, important economic targets to meet. And you know, to Patricia's point um, about how this is not just a question of solidarity and it's not charity, um, but it's about responsibility. We have to make sure that the global community sees exactly what we're dealing with. So while we don't want to inflate our GDP, we don't want to distort the numbers, um, ecosystem valuation and, and natural capital valuation is important for us to leverage resources that will again go back into investment and sustainability. So we think that there's that balance to be struck. Thank you very much. And uh, actually, I believe you have also uh, addressed another question that we had, which was, what's about investment in blue carbon ecosystem, mangrove and seagrass for restoration and rehabilitation? I believe uh, your answer was yes, a very strong yes. And I would like to join my voice because uh, when we speak about mangrove and seagrass, uh, we are speaking about some of the most uh, important uh, ecosystems in terms of carbon sequestration and its irrecoverable carbon. Once we have lost them, we have lost them at least for 30 to 40 years, and uh, yet we won't be able to recover it on time to avoid a, a, a climate catastrophe. The, I have a, Patricia, I have a fairly technical question, and I'm not so sure you will be comfortable about sharing too many uh, insights about that one, but so somehow you have the best place to, 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 address, to take it. This one is about carbon pricing mechanism. What changes in carbon pricing mechanisms are required to provide sufficient long-term financing for adaptation green projects in developing uh, countries? I'm sure that a few of our uh, participants are happy that they are not the one who have to address that question. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, uh, Yannick, unfortunately, it is a very difficult question, especially if we look at what has been happening over the, the, the last uh, couple of years regarding the negotiations on uh, carbon markets within our, our global um, uh, process. So as you, as you know, before uh, the Paris Agreement under the Kyoto Protocol, we had um, the, the uh, clean development mechanism, which uh, was uh, uh, functioning uh, 
as, as a central uh, mechanism for carbon markets. Um, now we have moved to Paris and we need to get agreement on how the new, the new mechanism under the Paris Agreement will be, will be functioning. It's not yet clear. It's not clear. We do not have, we have not been able to uh, get to a consensus. That was the big outstanding uh, point in the negotiations um, in uh, Madrid. So this is one of the big issues where we will need the uh, full weight uh, of uh, political level leaders like the ministers that are participating here in order to allow us to go forward. In our view now, it's a moment where we need to find the right political balance between all the different uh, aspects that are being discussed, which are, as you said, very, very technical. But uh, what I would um, say is um, maybe what should be the objective? The objective in my view should be that we do have a fully functioning uh, mechanism that is compatible with many of the uh, regional and local mechanisms that are, uh, uh, are currently function functioning. Um, and um, the most important uh, objective of that is really to allow the more vulnerable developing countries that have um, really do lack the capacity to develop their own uh, carbon markets uh, to get access from that source. So I don't know whether this answers your question, probably not, uh, but I, this is uh, uh, what I would like to to contribute at this stage. Knowing a little bit, uh, knowing a little bit the political economy behind these questions, I think Patricia, you were, uh, you did prove extremely open and uh, very comprehensive in your response. The uh, the reason why you saw my face suddenly for a fraction of a second is because I was asking my colleagues, can I ask a second round of questions? Because we are receiving a lot, a lot of questions, and they just told me that uh, unfortunately we are uh, running a little bit late and we will not be able to have a second round of questions. So if I could ask for a round of uh, virtual uh, applause for uh, our uh, first speakers. It was really, really great to have you uh, with us. And uh, the quality of the questions that I have in front of me is a testimony of the quality of uh, your uh, contribution. It's now uh, my privilege to welcome uh, Her Excellency Ms. Leonor Gebeisler, uh, Federal Minister for Climate Action from Austria, to uh, share our views on how to foster a green, resilient recovery. Minister, maybe before uh, giving you the floor, I would like on behalf of uh, the Green Climate Fund and all its partners to deeply thank uh, Austria for uh, its uh, contribution to the fund. Austria has increased by five-fold its contribution uh, to the uh, first replenishment of uh, the, uh, the GCF compared to the initial uh, recapitalization. For me, it's wonderful because whenever I will be, uh, uh, I will have my next discussion on the fund mobilization, I will say, can you try to do half as well as Austria? Two point uh, increase by 250%. So many thanks uh, to Austria, many thanks to the people of Austria, and uh, the floor is yours, Minister. Thanks a lot, Yannick, for this very, um, very nice introduction. Um, I have to say, though, we start from um, we started from a point where we, I knew when I took office this January we have a way to go, and I would like to ask uh, to to echo what Patricia Espinosa said. It's not only a question of um, solidarity; it's a question of responsibility. And so I'm I'm really very happy, and I'm very proud to be able to announce that we managed to secure additional funds that we could indeed increase the contribution. Uh, fivefold, which means by 100 million euro of additional or fresh uh, money to the fund, bringing our total contribution to 130 million euro. 
Um, so I'm, I'm happy, I'm proud that we managed to do that because I really uh, value the work of the GCF um, and um, I'm very thankful for organizing this, for, to you for organizing this event today and for having the opportunity to speak. And I would like to raise two points first on uh, green recovery um, and also sharing a bit the examples of what we did in Austria and then on why the GCF and why I, I'm, I'm, I think the GCF exactly at this point in time has a very crucial role to fulfill. And listening to all of you and the inspiring examples on how we're trying to tackle the same crisis across the globe from very different perspectives, but fighting for a better world, I think it's a very inspiring panel to be in. So um, starting from the exceptional situation we're in uh, at this stage, obviously the fight against the virus and against the ensuing economic turbulences we face is a top priority for all of us. But um, we're all also very much aware that while the COVID-19 crisis will eventually pass and we are all hoping for the vaccine um, to help us actually pass this crisis, the climate crisis will stay and it's still the biggest challenge we face on this globe. And we also know there is no vaccine against the climate crisis and there will be no vaccine against the climate crisis. And so this moment in time, this exceptional moment in time that we face now is really um, crucial for all, all of us to take the right decisions because an economic recovery not linked to the climate and environmental objectives would drastically intensify human and economic risks associated with climate change. So now is our moment to get it right. And I think one of the key questions in this is that we need to reward in our recovery efforts, the innovative, the committed ones to path the way towards the future and not to reward the old fossil and unresilient system. And I'm deeply convinced that doing climate investments right now will deliver actually a triple win. It will address the catastrophic invest, uh, impacts of climate change. It will re uh, revive our economies that are right now negatively affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, and it will create significant socioeconomic co-benefits, including poverty alleviation, job creation, gender equality, improved health, food and water security, which are also key uh, elements of reaching the sustainable development goals. And if I may uh, add two examples of how we tried to do this in, in Austria, how we try to, to actually deliver on this triple win. We, um, we uh, in, all in all, we, um, we made a 2 billion euro investment package in climate action, including just to give two examples, 650 million euro for uh, our renovation wave, our own renovation wave. So for retrofitting houses and exchanging old fossil fuel heating systems, gas, coal, uh, oil heating systems to renewable heating systems. With this, just to give you one number, we managed to secure and stabilize 45,000 jobs in the Austrian economy in a sector that's particularly hit. We also uh, invest out of these 2 billion euro, 300 million euro in um, public transport on top of um, other investments we do on a regular basis, but choosing to invest in public transport infrastructure, um, we, we managed to, uh, to especially foster uh, local um, uh, small and medium enterprises because 80% of these investments go to regional value creation jobs that we managed to stabilize um, in and we deliver a climate impact with that. So that's uh, how we can show that investing in the future will actually uh, will actually create a positive impact, but I think it's ex extremely important we also stop investing in the past. And I'd like to give you one example on how we did that. We, we created an investment premium for companies, which gives a, a, an average 7% 7 7 premium on investments that companies do, because they're extremely important right now for stabilizing our economy, for, for stabilizing also the job market. So we did two things with this investment premium. It doubles when you invest in climate action and there is a zero investment premium um, if you want to invest in, uh, in fossil fuel infrastructure. So we finally started to exclude fossil fuel infrastructure from 
uh, from, for example, this investment premium, which is, I think, a, a necessary step and maybe can be one little example of, of how you can uh, actually use this, this specific moment in time as a turning point. In parallel, we work on, on many different um, initiatives, such as a Renewables Deployment Act with the goal to have 100% renewable electricity by 2030. We work on a circular economy strategy, on a biodiversity strategy, because I think it's extremely important that we don't lose sight that biodiversity is our life insurance and that we need to keep that in mind um, on, an, on an equal footing. So with these examples, I think we can show in, in, the, in the different countries, how we can revive the economy, make our economies more resilient, more future-proof, and deliver on uh, climate action, and how we can actually deliver this triple win in challenging and difficult times. And I think this leads me to the, to the GCF, because as the world's largest climate fund for developing countries, with a wide network of partners, the Climate Fund can really create unique coalitions between member states, international and national organizations, the private sector and civil society to achieve this triple win. And the GCF's investment in climate action with high development co-benefits is critical for me. And at a time when also developing countries or especially probably developing countries facing massive unemployment and unprecedented economic contractions, GCF finance projects translate national climate ambitions into reality and catalyze larger financial flows that are critical for economic recovery. The GCF's uh, capacity to offer a wide range of financial instruments, including non-debt instruments, is also particularly, particularly relevant today, in my op uh, opinion. Developing countries, especially least developed countries and small island nations, developing states will not be able to take on additional debt to revive their economies. And so I'm, I'm convinced that the GCF can make a real difference today. Climate action is the solution to avoiding economic depression and fostering inequality. And yes, I want to repeat myself, it's not only a question of solidarity, it's for countries like Austria, questions of, uh, a question of responsibility to contribute to this. So we are really looking forward to continue our cooperation with the GCF and with our partners in the developing country and, um, countries. And I'm, I'm very eager to uh, listen in some more on the debates and to get some more uh, brilliant examples on, on what, you're, what, you're, what we all are trying to do right now in this exceptional moment on time in delivering a triple benefit for our people. Many, many thank Minister. This was brilliant. The uh, it's uh, I was maybe a bit unfair at the beginning of in my introductory remark when I said that uh, the bulk of the economic stimulus measures being developed by uh, OECD countries were not that green. Listening to the experience of Austria, so next time I will I will add a few provisio. The uh, it's uh, during uh, during your presentation we have received a, a couple of uh, questions uh, asking whether this uh, video will be shared online. Actually, the, the video is already shared online and will remain online. So participants who uh, would like to basically rewind and re-listen to some uh, to some intervention will be able to do it uh, at uh, the leisure. The uh, uh, minister, we are deeply committed to make a blended finance uh, works for seeds and LDCs. And unfortunately, why in theory it's wonderful to use uh, a scarce public money in a highly catalytic manner to leverage much, much larger uh, private finance to uh, scale up climate action. In practice, it doesn't work that well. The leveraging ratios tend to be relatively low. And, uh, and this does not work that well, particularly for seeds and uh, LDCs. And it doesn't work that well for adaptation and ecosystems. And so we are mostly seeing it uh, uh, the, uh, delivering what is, was expected to deliver in relatively mature economies, mature markets for mature technologies. And indeed, uh, the Green Climate Fund is capital agnostic. We can provide any kind of grant or non-grant uh, instruments. And we believe that uh, this uh, gives us a unique uh, opportunity to, uh, to uh, explore new form of blended finance that will truly work for seeds and LDCs.
So many thanks, Minister Gewechsler, for your uh, intervention. It's, uh, j'ai maintenant le grand plaisir de donner la parole à Madame uh, la Ministre Arlette Soudan-Nono, Ministre du Tourisme et de l'Environnement de la République du Congo. Uh, Arlette, quand nous nous sommes uh, rencontrés uh, uh, il y a pas si longtemps que ça, à Sangdo, la dernière fois, c'était en, en, en mars, où nous avons beaucoup parlé des masques pour le Covid-19. On a aussi parlé du fond bleu, on a aussi parlé de la protection de la, du, du bassin du Congo, de la protection des tourbières. Euh, Aurais-tu l'obligeance de partager un peu de ton expérience avec nous ben, Vraiment, merci Yannick, merci, bonjour à tous. Vraiment... Euh... Que vous dire Aujourd'hui, il y a cette urgence. C'est vrai que nous sortons, nous sommes confrontés à la pandémie du Covid-19, mais nous ne devons pas oublier cette urgence climatique qui, qui demeure, qui demeure, qui demeure. Et les tourbières du bassin du Congo, euh, c'est quand même 145 500 carrés que nous partageons avec la République démocratique du Congo, qui capture pas moins de 30 milliards de tonnes de gaz à à émission d'effet de serre. Et aujourd'hui, nous courons après le temps parce que c'est une bombe à retardement. C'est vraiment une bombe à retardement. Mais qu'avons-nous fait Nous nous sommes organisés avec le Maroc qui nous a proposé, euh, en marge de la COP22, le roi du Maroc nous a proposé trois commissions dédiées à ces questions de changement climatique. Et nous, nous sommes dans la commission euh, du bassin du Congo, à la tête de laquelle il y a le président Denis Sassou Nguesso. Moi, j'en assure la coordination technique. Nous avons un, 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 un véhicule financier qui est le fonds bleu que vous venez de rappeler, Yannick, à l'instant. Le fonds bleu a déjà bouclé son étude de préfiguration. Nous travaillons d'ailleurs étroitement avec, euh, avec, avec vous. Nous travaillons étroitement. Nous sommes euh, aujourd'hui, nous avons porté près de 215 projets sur ces questions de l'économie bleue autour du fond bleu pour le bassin du Congo. Le bassin du Congo, j'aime également à le rappeler, c'est pas moins... C'est le second poumon écologique de la planète après l'Amazonie. Donc, nous avons des chiffres euh, effroyables. C'est 10 de la biodiversité mondiale aujourd'hui. Et nous courons, nous courons après, euh, après les financements. Euh, nous devons noter que les, les, les 15 États, plus sain le Maroc, qui se sont mis ensemble aujourd'hui en quelque chose de fondamental, les projets qu'ils ont mis ensemble sont issus des contributions déterminées nationales. Généralement, on, on est un peu dispersé, mais là, nous avons réussi au sein de notre commission dédiée à ces questions de changement climatique, les 16 pays que nous représentons donc au sein de ce bassin du Congo, à avoir 215 projets qui sont donc issus donc des CDN des différents États. Et nous avons besoin, nous avons besoin aujourd'hui de toutes de toutes les ressources, comme lorsque vous l'avez annoncé, l'Autriche nous apporte, la ministre l'a rappelé tout à l'heure, pas moins de 130 millions dans les caisses du Fonds vert pour le climat. Nous saluons, nous saluons ce type d'initiative et nous attendons également, Yannick, de nous retrouver, de nous retrouver avec vous en, euh, à, pendant le One Planet Summit afin de syndiquer, comme il est convenu, le Fonds vert pour le climat, le Fonds bleu pour le bassin du Congo et le Fonds de l'environnement mondial. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, nous avons identifié ces projets. Il nous faut maintenant aller à des financements parce que nous avons encore les financements de l'Université de Leeds, près de 5 millions de, 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 de d'euros qui nous sont octroyés dans le cadre de la recherche parce qu'une fois que la découverte a été mise au jour, il nous faut maintenant savoir qu'est-ce que c'est que ces tourbières. Mais il y a quelque chose que je voudrais vous annoncer ici qui va vous faire froid dans le dos, pourquoi j'insiste, que nous courons après le temps, parce qu'aujourd'hui, il est avéré que la, la différence qu'il y a entre les tourbières de la République démocratique du Congo et le nôtre en République du Congo est qu'au niveau de, de, du Congo-Brazzaville, euh, si nous perdons, nous procédons à une grande déforestation, eh bien, nous perdons les tourbières, parce que les tourbières sont irriguées par la pluie et non par le sol. Et donc, aujourd'hui, les populations riveraines qui vivent d'agriculture ont l'habitude de dessoucher, de défricher, et nous courons, nous courons. Nous avons une étude faite avec la Banque mondiale qui nous dit comment aller vers cette agriculture de savane un peu plus loin, mais nous n'en avons pas non plus les financements pour la mise en œuvre. Donc, euh, nous avons besoin de mutualiser nos énergies pour qu'ensemble, nous puissions préserver ce patrimoine 
euh, écologiques, ces écosystèmes d'une rare fragilité qui sont les tourbières du bassin du Congo aujourd'hui, au travers donc le fond bleu pour le bassin du Congo qui est porté par pas moins de 16 États autour de cette grande problématique de changement climatique. Voilà ce que je pouvais, mais vraiment sans détour, dire les choses tout simplement. Nous sommes devant cette urgence avec cette bombe à retardement, Yannick. Je ne vous entends pas. Je ne sais pas Merci. si vous m'avez entendu. Merci beaucoup voilà, là, je vous pour, de nouveau. pour cette présentation. C'est vraiment un grand plaisir euh, euh, de, de voir que les travaux avancent en fait euh, très rapidement. Et j'espère en effet que nous aurons l'occasion euh, de nous revoir en personne euh, pour le One Planet Summit, tout du moins de façon virtuelle. Les, euh, she, um, no. The, uh, we, are, uh, we, on, uh, we are a bit running indeed behind time, and uh, the, uh, I have two, uh, two extremely important speakers uh, who have been patiently waiting for, uh, to, to intervene. Uh, His Excellency Mr. Simon Steele, Minister for Climate Resilience, the Environment, Forestry, Fisheries and Disaster Management, Grenada. Hi, Simon, it's really great to see you. And uh, His Excellency Lord Ahmad of Wimbledon, Minister of State for South Asia and the Commonwealth, and Prime Minister Special Representative on Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict, United Kingdom. Lord Ahmad, uh, it's really a great pleasure to have you uh, back uh, with us. The, I understand uh, that uh, you have to leave us at uh, 9.55. That's, uh, your, you, you don't have a lot of time anymore remaining. Simon, would you accept that we change the order? That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Many, many thanks, uh, Simon. Le, Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, the, uh, maybe before giving you the floor, uh, I would like once again to thank uh, the, United, the government of the United uh, Kingdom for its contribution to the Green Climate Fund. UK is the largest contributor to the uh, Green Climate Fund and its contribution for this first replenishment is 1 billion 440 million pound, if my memory is correct. The, uh, and so uh, on behalf of uh, all our partners, uh, I would like to uh, deeply uh, thank you and the people of uh, UK. And uh, also it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to have you with us and uh, to be able maybe to hear from you about uh, some of the preparations for uh, COP26 and how this will, uh, will be aligned with uh, the need to foster a green, resilient uh, economy. Lord Ahmad, the floor is yours. Thank you <coughs> very much, Yannick. Uh, ministers, Excellencies, colleagues, friends. Uh, may I start, first of all, to thanking Simon, actually, for allowing me. We all know as ministers um, the challenges of your diary, and uh, I, I'm scheduled for a meeting with the boss's team, the prime minister's team, very shortly. So thank you for accommodating a, a very important request. Um, and Yannick, thank you for your kind introduction. And I think as we've heard already from other speakers, that as we deal with the pandemic that is COVID-19, which is gripping us, we remain very committed, of course, and rightly to determine to save lives and build livelihoods. But we must also, to draw an analogy, look for those green shoots of recovery. And that does mean that as we come out of this global pandemic, we seek every opportunity to create that greener, healthier, more inclusive and ever resilient economic and societal picture and horizon, whilst accelerating progress towards the SDGs goals and of course the Paris Agreement and building upon that. The challenges, as we all recognize, are massive. They're enormous. These are multiplied for the most vulnerable in suffering the double burden of not only the pandemic, but the effects of climate change. And therefore we need a recovery from this pandemic that enables climate resilient growth, protects biodiversity as several speakers have said, and promotes sustainable ways of living for all. But we cannot achieve it on our own. And that's therefore the work of the, um, your fund as well as with key partners, collective action is crucial. It's only by working together, coming together, we can tackle these twin challenges that are engulfing us at the moment, both of COVID-19 and climate change. And it's through initiatives such as the May 2020 financing for development work and the work stream on recovering better 
for sustainability, which the UK is leading jointly with Rwanda, Fiji and the EU, that we see results being delivered, collaboration at the highest level. Hundreds of policy ideas were suggested in the financing for development discussions, and we have now prioritised some transformational actions. And these will, as you said in your introduction, Janet, feature as part of our work and programme as we host COP26 in Glasgow next year now in 2021. And ahead of COP26, we want all countries to submit updated and enhanced nationally determined contributions. NDCs are key, integrated within their own recovery plans to accelerate the transformation to modern, cleaner economies. And we want member states also to commit to aligning their spending with the Paris Agreement. And as we've done in the UK, we hope that many countries can commit to a net zero target. As the incoming COP president, we've identified five key areas where we want all countries, colleagues to help speed up the progress as part of our collective global recovery. First of all, clean energy. We need to move away from the polluted past to embrace low cost zero emission technologies. And there's some incredible work being done in this respect. In resilience, we need to help communities adapt to the worst effects of climate change through resilient infrastructure, for example, helping them bet, better plan for and cope with disasters. And we've seen that recently with the investment countries such as Bangladesh have made in mangrove forests, which mitigated the results of a serious challenge that they faced on their own coastline most recently. In nature, building into that, we also thirdly need to safeguard ecosystems and protect natural habitats. We must increase nature-based solutions such as the mangroves I've just mentioned to ensure that we make our supply chains green as well. In transport, there needs to be a rapid global shift to zero emission vehicles. Our aim is for all new UK car and van sales to be zero emission by 2040, and indeed earlier, if at all possible. And in finance, we need to unleash the capital that will pay for these actions. This includes developed countries fulfilling our commitment to the $100 billion goal getting more finance to flow into low carbon investments and building new public-private partnerships to increase sustainable private finance to develop countries. Using public finance effectively is a key to an inclusive, resilient recovery, finding the best ways to mobilize and channel capital to countries, sectors, and projects that need it. The GCF has played a pivotal role in this regard. And I'm delighted that the UK's pledge of now over $1.8 billion makes us the largest contributor to the fund, but it also underlines the importance we place on working collaboratively, collectively on our shared global institutions. We have championed an inclusive recovery from the pandemic, stressing support for the most vulnerable to build fairer societies and ensure no one is left behind. Therefore, the United Kingdom has also committed a further $1 billion of aid to tackle COVID-19 supporting countries in addressing both the direct and indirect impact to areas such as girls' education and strong and resilient health systems. And we will continue, I assure you, in concluding my remarks to drive these ambitions through our forthcoming presidencies of both the G7 and of course, COP26 next year. But as I said right from the outset, it can't be done together. It needs collective action, collaborative action. And therefore, I look forward to continuing to work with all of you. And finally, as a poignant reflection, when we look at the challenges of the pandemic, we look at the challenges of climate change. Simply put, the stakes could not be higher, but ultimately, the prize we have in front of us is great. Thanks, Yannick. Many thanks, sir. Many thanks, sir. Lord Ahmad. The, it's also a wonderful way to uh, summarize COP26. The stakes could not be higher, but the price uh, could not be uh, better if we can make it work. I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge responsibility, but uh, I cannot think about uh, anybody else uh, who could uh, better uh, fulfill the promise of COP26. The many, many thanks for joining us. I would like now to give the floor to uh, uh, His Excellency Minister Simon Steele, my friend Simon, who might not rem remain my friend for very long if uh, I keep postponing him. The, uh, it's, uh, Simon, you must have 
you must have you must have wanted to jump at least ten times uh, when Marsha was making her presentation, because uh, several of uh, her points did strongly echo some uh, of your points. So it might be a, a very strong uh, Car Caribbean uh, uh, common visions. So the floor is yours, and I believe I know some of the points you are to make. <laughs> Yannick, I, I I thank you, and with regard to Marsha's comments, we are swimming in the same ocean, we're in the same boat. So um, many of our priorities and our approaches um, are, are certainly aligned. So recognizing my friends in the GCF, in Songdu, in Colombia, Barbados, Patricia, colleague panelists, a very warm Grenadian good morning to all of you. Yannick, you started um, today's session with the question are we at a tipping point or a turning point? And that is an excellent question and highly relevant to where we are today and the challenges that, um, that we face. With global financing for climate resilience already inadequate, the call for additional resources to fight the COVID pandemic simply compounds the problems that we face. We've heard Marsha outlined it um, beautifully, um, how COVID has brutally stripped bare our vulnerabilities, especially as small island developing states. Whether those are our social vulnerabilities brought on um, by the pandemic, the economic pandemic that we're now having to face, and there is no vaccine for that, with our borders shut and tourism in suspended animation. And then our physical vulnerabilities with climate change, our new normal, as we sit here in the middle of yet another active hurricane season, praying, praying that nothing comes our way. However, we are all in agreement that the COVID pandemic offers us a unique opportunity and an opportunity that cannot be squandered all the development agencies are now aligned in their thinking, whether it's talk of a green recovery, a blue recovery, building back better, building forward. And I've followed the discussion, been part of that dialogue since the, uh, the, the global lockdown in how we can best take advantage of these challenges and turn them into an opportunity. So all of the right words are there. The question is, Will we? Will we take advantage of this opportunity that has been presented to us? Of the trillions of dollars that have already been invested globally in stimulus packages, half have been on non, non low carbon programs. So, a tipping point or a turning point, the jury is still out. Words are not yet translated into action. We've heard, um, Yannick, your outline of five concrete actions that highlight the unique position that the GCF is in and the leader, leadership position and responsibility that rests on your shoulders. And you are taking the lead in this regard. So whether it is uh, exploring sovereign backed guarantees to invest in resilience building, the greening of national development banks, the creation of new asset classes, and translating NDCs into the pipeline of bankable projects. What I would add to your comments, Yannick, is that we, we mustn't only look at our NDCs, we must look at our national adaptation plans too. Adaptation is central to the approach that small island developing states must take to protect themselves against, um, against climate change. And we need to spend more time exploring those business models. How can we catalyze, how can we leverage up financing inflows to demonstrate the viability of adaptation projects? And then of course, debt for climate swaps. These are all valid tools um, that can be used to, um, to address the financing challenges that, that we face. 
But I believe that in addition to these mechanisms, we must also look at a critical issue for small island developing states, and that is reconsidering the OECD rules on concessionality, the graduation eligibility of middle-income countries, um, and those rules that discriminate against many small island developing states and do not factor in our extreme vulnerabilities. And of course, access to affordable financing, both at scale and at speed. And if we do not reconsider these rules that are holding us back, if not now in this time of crisis, then when? So this is a question um, as developed nations must be asked. So the real challenge for us now is putting um, all of these things into action and Patricia outlined that um, very well, a call for action and the need for greater solidarity and this global responsibility that we have. But Yannick, I can assure you that Grenada will be calling on the GCF shortly to put to the test some of these out of the box thinking that, um, that, that, that has been presented. Um, with our submission of our Climate Smart Cities program, this is a program that you and I, the GCF and Grenada have spoken about in great detail. It is an ambitious plan to establish St. George's, our capital city, as the first climate resilient, climate smart city within the region, which addresses our key, many of our key vulnerabilities, whether it's looking for solutions that address sea level rise, urban densification, addressing the vulnerabilities of communities, the scaling up of renewable energy and energy efficiency, and the use of nature-based solutions, and of course, that all-important capacity building to institutionalize um, uh, those learnings. And knowing that we cannot fund the hundreds of millions of dollars that will be required for Grenada alone to implement this ambitious plan through traditional financing flows, we will be putting these innovative financing tools to the test and we look forward to that continued engagement. So on reflection of today's session, some of the key takeaways that, um, that, 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 that I think we can all agree on is that the threats that we face, whether physical, economic, or social, are real. That the, global, the current global response so far has been weaker than it needs to be. But there is hope. There are opportunities. There are solutions. And certainly amongst the most vulnerable states, there is political will. We've heard the statements from Colombia, from Barbados, um, from the Congo, and the considerable ambition that Grenada is demonstrating, and the commitment of developed states such as Austria and the UK in providing support. So leadership is being shown by institutions such as the GCF, and the need for us to um, embrace this partnership as developing developed nations together with institutions such as the, 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 the GCF and how we can best strengthen those relationships. But there is a need for additional global effort. We also heard of the importance and the important role that COP26 will have and the importance of reaching a successful outcome all of those outstanding issues that we've kicked down the road since Paris, the $100 billion pledge, loss and damage, the Paris rule book, all of these vexing issues must be addressed successfully in Glasgow in 2021. So back, Yannick, to your opening question. Are we at a tipping point or a turning point? I think the key takeaway it's up to us collectively to make this a turning point. I thank you.
Many, many thanks, uh, Simon. We uh, we still have uh, one uh, one uh, last speaker, but with uh, with your agreement, could I say that you have just uh, concluded uh, made, made the concluding remark of uh, of uh, of the uh, the conference because. Uh, I don't think that I can add anything to what you have just said. So uh, maybe with the agreement of, uh, of uh, all participants, you, the air will be a concluding remark. Yes, uh, tipping point or turning point, the jury is still out, but uh, there is hope. There is hope because when you listen to every single uh, presentation made, there are some extremely strong uh, commonalities of views. There is a wealth of experience that can be shared, that can be uh, replicated. And uh, individually, we might not be that strong. Collectively, we are a major force to uh, recome. And it's a bit the, the one of the objective of such a workshop is to make sure that uh, we, uh, we, uh, we bring our collective voice uh, to bear. Regarding, uh, regarding the GCF, uh, the, we can only uh, provide a modest contribution, but so uh, we are working on each of the points I've mentioned, notably for translating uh, NDCs and adaptation uh, plan into investment plan. We have put in place several mechanisms using our readiness program, our grant program, to be able to provide financial resources uh, to all governments that might wish to avail themselves this opportunity in a relatively fast manner, actually in a very fast manner. Uh, we believe that we should be able to provide this financial resources in 60 days. And uh, blended finance, as I've mentioned uh, to uh, uh, Minister Gates-Weisler, we are working right now on different type of blended finance uh, the, uh, to make sure that this works for small island development states and LDCs. And actually, uh, uh, that's one of the key points we had discussed uh, in Songdo uh, in August uh, 2019. So I hope to see some of the first uh, projects uh, uh, seeing the light of the day, uh, uh, actually as early as uh, as the end of this year, the there were a question in Spanish regarding. Uh, the National Development Bank. Uh, what we are doing for, for the National Development Bank, we are currently uh, um, uh, 39 of our 150 partners are National Development Banks, and uh, we are co-organizing the summit of uh, uh, financing comment that we are sponsoring. The uh, the uh, well, one of we are one of the sponsor of the of the summit, and that will bring all the National Development Banks, the 450 National Development Bank uh, in Paris on November. 12. And uh, on our side, uh, we are committed to providing uh, uh, grant assistance uh, to national development banks to be able to uh, develop the capacity to, to uh, adopt a green uh, mandate. And we are also working on taxonomy, etc. And this will be with an immense pleasure. That's uh, I, I, I will have a chance to discuss further uh, this with you when, uh, when Granda comes with uh, its, uh, its own integrated uh, plan. So Simon, many, many thanks for wrapping up uh, our, uh, our seminar in an extremely elegant uh, manner, much better than what I could have done. The, uh, but so we have uh, a few more minutes uh, no, we are just behind time, but uh, I'm told uh, the uh, I with for your indulgence, uh, would it be would you accept that uh, uh, that we we take a few additional minutes so that we can hear from uh, Mr. Kot Von, the international chief advisor from the China Council for International Cooperation and Environment and Development, CSED and China have been working on the green resilient uh, recovery uh, plan, and uh, it's uh, it's wonderful to have the opportunity, uh, Mr. Von, to hear about it. Good. Thank you, uh, Yannick. Thank you very much, and excellencies. Um, really brilliant. Congratulations on such a rich discussion. I, I know you're pressed for time, so I will be one minute. Um, and just to say three very quick points. So uh, the China Council has completed its recommendations for 2020 that were submitted to the State Council about a month ago. Um, very much focused on what should happen in the 14th five-year plan. They were released in Beijing yesterday, and they're now online. Uh, I'll just mention a couple of highlights. So the first, very much in line with the discussions we've heard uh, from the president of Colombia, from the ministers, 
Um, this is an opportunity, despite the unprecedented pressure, uh, to align an ambitious economic stimulus package with decarbonization. China announced last week in the context of the China-EU bilateral discussions, uh, climate and carbon neutrality. So what will happen on the timing for that? Second quick highlight is the Green Belt and Road Initiative. I think China, there's a recognition of the need to improve uh, the projects that are moving forward uh, uh, would be our I countries and two aspects of that. Uh, one is to adopt new standards aligned to the SDGs in order to ensure new project funding uh, is sustainable, low carbon, uh, green, uh, including nature-based solutions. But the second one that several ministers have now mentioned is the, uh, the, 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 the coming crisis around debt um, and how new approaches to debt sustainability should include options, for example, on debt bonds uh, linked to climate and nature, uh, as well as debt swaps. There are good examples from Seychelles, from Jamaica and elsewhere. And this is going to be a, an important area for the work in the next basically six months. And, and the final um, uh, point, uh, Yannick, is uh, just the importance of greening supply chains, particularly in soft commodities and timber, soy, uh, and others, a major driver of deforestation. China is the largest importer of these commodities. So how can China look at adopting sustainability sourcing standards uh, in a way uh, that works towards the SDGs? And with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Scott. I think it's uh, this was uh, this was extremely rich, despite the fact that so uh, you did compress it in less than two minutes. And uh, this marks the end of our uh, high-level leadership uh, dialogue. More than 500 people have joined us through uh, uh, Zoom and uh, YouTube for the entire duration of the dialogue. And uh, Simon, that shows that actually we are quite a lot uh, sharing the same uh, ambition. And uh, I would like to uh, deeply thank them for being uh, for joining us for being part of this discussion we have received a very large number of uh, questions and i would like to apologize for not having been able to uh, to uh, to uh, to ask them to our participants due to time uh, constraint but so uh, the uh, we we will most likely consider maybe a follow-up discussion at a later stage because clearly the, there is a major appetite uh, for uh, learning for, uh, from leaders about their experience and some of uh, the initiatives they will be pushing in the coming month. So uh, your excellencies, uh, dear uh, colleagues and friends, many thanks for uh, joining us. I will now hand over to uh, Babita, our uh, Master of Ceremony and actually one of the key uh, uh, players behind this event for officially closing it. Thank you so much, Yannick. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, thank you so much for joining us today. As the ED mentioned, we had We've had more than 500 participants, Zoom and YouTube, and the recording of this event will be uploaded on the event website and we will circulate uh, the link shortly. Um, thank you to our interpreters. Thank you to our amazing team. Uh, we look forward to engaging with you in our next GCF event. It's the Private Investment for Climate Conference from the 14th to the 16th of October. Please don't forget to register on our website and thank you so very much once again.